Terence Howard has been risking his entire career and possibly his life. He discovered something that may revolutionize our entire existence. I don't care what happens. I'm here to bring the truth at whatever cost that comes with it. And they don't want you to know that because then you will know and this is going to make them angry. I'm at the point now where I'm ready to war. So I challenge any chemist, any physicist, any astrophysicist, any cosmologist, any biologist, anyone within the fields of science to come and challenge me. These are proofs. This isn't theories anymore. Theories are written out and need to be proven. These are geometric proofs. Before we delve deeper into the concept he's explaining, let me share something very interesting that truly caught my attention. After making all the information public, Terence faced significant criticism and ridicule in the mainstream media. Interestingly, a typical pattern is observed. First is ridicule. The Platonic fact. solids. <laughs> right. Aren't you getting a he's star? rebuilding the universe. Yes, you go, right. well, you're getting a star. Yes, <laughs> Initially, the person's ideas or statements are mocked, making it challenging for them to be taken seriously by others. Second event, opposition. But if you go by your logic and if you define beforehand, that something like it logically it makes the most sense that one times one Same. and then that's where the mathematical convention comes in and that's like most like large part of math is convention it's how it has been defined it's a matter of definition with that thing that I showed you did you look at the square root of two do you think that that's a loop that that's a natural thing with the square root of two did you believe that Pi, just like more mathematical. No, 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 it's not the same though. It's not the same with pi. What we just did, we multiplied it, we cubed the number, and then we divided it by two, and we cubed it again and divided it by two, and we did that a number of times, and that number still remained the same exact number, which we know cannot happen. The third one is acceptance. There's a potential final stage where the public's perception begins to shift. The ideas or the person that were once ridiculed and opposed might start to see some level of acceptance. Terrence Howard, uh, the guy who interviewed me for Rolling Stone, told me that Terrence Howard is like a legitimate genius. Like he's like, you talk to the guy, the guy is absolutely brilliant. Besides what Joe Rogan said, Terence has recently garnered a lot of attention and numerous views on YouTube. 3 million views here, 2.8 million there, 1.4 million, 1.3 million, and many more. This says a lot. Perhaps he's right and we haven't realized it yet. Let's analyze the entire concept. Please pay close attention and rewind if you feel you didn't keep up with the information. All of our math is based upon approximation unrealistic things and that's why they're angry at me because i'm upsetting their cart but in order for us to advance to a level one society a level one civilization we have to abandon the lie no matter how attached to it we are no matter how much if you find out that the foundation of your house is about to crack and you've got many many stories of generations on top of it you pull all those people out and you fix that foundation they don't want to do that with our man they would rather let us die i'm here i don't care what happens i'm here to bring the truth at whatever cost that comes with it but the truth is here that's why i put the book out for free in his book which you can find at tc cotlc.com on the first page he mentions something shocking about our math system allow me to enlighten you if four divided by two is the inverse operation of two times two equaling four then it would naturally follow that two divided by one is the inverse operation of one times one equaling two what does your common sense tell you about these two scenarios what do they have in common and what are their differences? Division. The number four is divided by two twice. And the truth is, the number two is divided by one twice. Addition, two plus two equals four. And one plus one equals two. Subtraction. 4 minus 2 equals 2, and 2 minus 1 equals 1. Multiplication, 2 times 2 equals 4, and 1 times 1 equals 1. Can you see where the mistake has occurred? Do you know how I figured it out? What's 1 times 1? 1 times 1 is 1. To multiply means to do what? To make more, right? Yes. Increase in number? Yes. Multiply? Yes. How can 1 times 1 equaling 1 be part of the multiplication table? It was to satisfy the term multiply. It doesn't multiply. Terence explains that multiplication involves making more or increasing in number. When one object exerts a force on another, the second object also exerts a force in return on the first object. Similarly, if one object applies pressure to another, the second object responds with pressure exerted back onto the first object. For example, take a calculator and input the number 2, followed by finding its square root. The result will be approximately 1.414213562373. Now perform 
perform two different actions with this result, multiplied by 2 and raise it to the power of 3. Both actions yield the same value. 2.8284271217461906190. Now divide the result by 2 and cube it again, and you will get the same value again. It shows how different mathematical operations on the same number can yield unexpected yet consistent results. You see that, Lou? Yeah. That's saying x cubed is equal to 2x, which is equal to x plus x. That's an unnatural equation. That's a mathematical fallacy. And that's the beginning of your math. Someone programmed that lie in there and lied to you and you and everyone and all your fundamentals are off. And then everybody said I was crazy. Well, am I crazy or is the calculator broke? Another aspect that Terence explains is that in a delicate equilibrium, chemicals are essentially nothing more than the motion of either electricity or magnetism. Matter is just motion that originates from two fundamental motions, electricity, a manifestation of centripetal force, a proceeding motion, and magnetism, which arises from centrifugal motion, or moving away from the center. These phenomena are not tangible entities, but rather effects of specific motions. Everything in the universe is spinning to the right or left, contracting or expanding, with each element preceded and succeeded by a noble gas. Every element has a noble gas that precedes before it and after it. And there are three steps to folding an element. And an element is just a pressure condition. It's just a periodistic pressure condition. And we say periodistic because it repeats itself something predictable. When you get this kind of pressure condition, this is the element that will show, or this is the crystallization that will occur. If you get this pressure condition, the crystallization is even tighter. You get this pressure condition, the crystallization is tighter. And we call each of those crystallizations a different element, but it's the same substance under different motion and pressure conditions. He gave the example of hydrogen concerning other elements, shares similarities with carbon, silicon, cobalt, and rhodium regarding their tonal conditions. There is a pattern where certain elements have three elements preceding them and three elements succeeding them in the periodic table. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A should be equal to C. So how is it that hydrogen doesn't have three elements that proceed before it and also three elements that proceed after it before you get to helium? It's an entire octave within itself. Our perception of elemental relationships might be influenced by our cognitive and physiological processes, such as how we perceive motion. Human perception is minimal when understanding higher states of matter or more dense conditions. The differences hinder our ability to perceive these states in temporal dimensions between us and these states. Hydrogen is the first element we can perceive, but 21 other elements occur before it. These elements are described not as permanent entities, but as conditions conditions or conditional facts. It implies that altering the conditions under which an element exists can result in a different manifestation. For instance, changing the pressure condition of carbon can transform it into nitrogen and oxygen. Despite these changes, the fundamental nature of the element remains the same. For a better understanding, consider that a lab-grown diamond is a fascinating example of transforming carbon from one form into another, more structured form, specifically into a diamond. To make a diamond in a lab, scientists start with a tiny seed of diamond and a form of carbon like graphite. They put these into a machine that creates a very hot and pressurized environment, much like deep inside the earth where natural diamonds form. This intense heat and pressure make the carbon atoms rearrange themselves and grow layer by layer onto the diamond seed. After a few weeks, the carbon turns into a sparkling lab-grown diamond. It's just like a natural diamond, but made by humans. In reality, we only perceive less than one half of 1% of the total spectrum, yet we base our judgments on this limited perception. So human perception is limited in understanding the electromagnetic spectrum, including visible light and other forms of radiation. We are cosmically blind on a conscious and cosmic level. There's no death on Mars. There's no death on any planet. Everything is alive and just in a different state of distance based on the motion and pressure conditions. But there is no death. Death is the comparable to sleeping, where life is being awake. 
Terence continued to explain that we must acknowledge the eternal cycle of existence, where all things participate in the processes of inhaling and exhaling, the exchange of gases in living organisms, and the cycling of matter and energy in ecosystems and the universe at large. It challenges the conventional understanding of electric charge, particularly the idea of being solely negatively charged. When an entity loses its electric charge, it discharges its electricity, and this loss occurs when it seeks a high pressure condition where centrifugal force dominates. On the other hand, magnetism acts to push away from this high pressure condition. These behaviors are attributed to the motion of a fluid-like substance, possibly referring to the ether which spins either to the right or the left. Newton's third law of motion states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. It is a dynamic interplay between electric charge and magnetism in the context of pressure conditions and the motion of a fluid-like substance. These forces interact in predictable ways, influencing the behavior of matter in the universe. Light doesn't travel. Light reproduces itself. With each octave, with each wave, it has a full life cycle of birth, growing up, maturing, mating, and then reproducing into the next octave. Every wave of life is an entire, of light itself, is an entire family. Another intriguing concept that Terence Howard is explaining is the flower of life symbol. The flower of life symbol, featuring overlapping circles in a flower pattern, is found worldwide but often overlooked in history books, keeping it relatively unknown. This symbol, seen in ancient ruins and on megalithic pillars at the Temple of Osiris, is depicted in red and has sparked debates about its age due to nearby Greek graffiti, suggesting a later addition by ancient Greeks, possibly influenced by Pythagoras. Unveil by Jomvalo Melchizedek, its presence spans from a 2,600-year-old Assyrian stone in Iraq to Leonardo da Vinci's drawings and from Roman mosaics in Turkey to a statue in Beijing's Forbidden City, reflecting its significance across various cultures and eras. Despite its ancient root, the flower of life continues to fascinate, marking sacred sites and historical artifacts around the globe. The oldest images that we have from antiquity and found on every continent is this image where 60 four circles are overlapped and it's called the flower of life and on every continent it was found in whatever language it was always called the flower of life mm -hmm. well six thousand years ago or however long ago someone had the clever idea of saying you know what why don't i draw straight lines where the circles overlap. This old interpretation talks about finding an average in the spaces where circles come together. One of these circles you have to see as a magnetic field. That's how magnetism behaves, everything expands. From this, a shape called the tetrahedron comes out, showing us that real life doesn't have perfectly straight lines. 6,000 years ago, they began to average the space where the circles overlap. So that tetrahedron mm -hmm. that we see. This comes from the idea that all energy moves, all movement creates waves and all waves bend. So making a straight line is impossible because every action has a reaction that balances it out. This bend we see is just everything balancing itself within a system. The greater the resistance and the greater that curvature. This curvature is the equanimity of all the interactions within a particular system. It all balances out into these perfect spheres which are magnetic fields around each other, which is a discharging aspect. And where these magnetic fields interact, this is where electricity begins. Where they overlap, they're forced to create spin. But 6,000 years ago, they said they're going to average the spin and they generated straight lines. And now you can clearly see that even the cube where we get Pythagorean theorem from, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, is an average. It's an approximation. Mm -hmm. But most of our math is our algebra, our calculus, all of those things are generated through this circumstance, which also led into why one times one, you know, could not possibly equal one, because what if you made each side of those lengths one, then you couldn't get the proper hypotenuse. The problem starts when we try to make all shapes follow the same rules, like when we can't get the right length for the longest side of a triangle. This issue is a big deal in the study of shapes because it shows us that even the most perfect shapes are really just 
average forms. Euclid was an old-time Greek math expert who was good at studying shapes and thinking logically. He went to Egypt and wrote down important rules about shapes, which was a big step forward for math. But over time, some people changed his ideas or said he did things he didn't. Even with these mix-ups, Euclid's smart thoughts, like his study of a shape with 12 sides called the dodecahedron, have lasted a long time. This shows how strong and important his way of thinking about shapes still is in math talks today. In the following minutes, Terence will explain the entire concept using the app he created. Pay attention. So what I decided to do, what I was instructed to do, was to take the same flower. So we go to my app, this right here, this is what they'll find. And what he has there, uh, there's an icon going from left to right, is what happens when four bubbles meet. I took the actual curved triangular pieces and I put four of them together based on universal ratios. And this is what it generated. What you're looking at right here, if you'll rotate it, this is the point where four bubbles meet. This is the negative space that they cannot compress. This is what we would call dark matter. This is the proton, the geometry of hydrogen itself. It has eight poles, it has four contractive poles, and that's where it concaves in and it has electricity seeking a higher pressure condition will cause a cavity and magnetism unable to maintain its electrical potential ends up spinning off of the vortices. Four bubbles describe the presence of four spheres occupying this specific space. The negative space we observe is the area that remains between these four spheres as they converge together. According to Terence's explanation, the flower of life concept represents fundamental principles communicated by advanced civilizations thousands of years ago. These principles highlight the essential nature of expansion and contraction in the universe. That these would be the fundamentals because everything expands as a sphere. Everything in the universe expands in spherical form and contracts in geometric patterns. These contractions occur due to the impact of expanding waves reaching the edge of the universe and rebounding back. This process is described as periodic, forming structures such as hydrogen and the proton. Now this is what happens when eight bubbles meet. This is the negative space where eight bubbles have met. A tetrahedron shape forms when eight bubbles converge, creating a negative space. For instance, if we look at this image, it has eight contracted poles. If you rotate it, you'll see four around one side and another four on the opposite side. That totals eight contracted electric poles. However, there are only six magnetic poles indicated by points where discharge occurs. Only six points where it's discharging. When you're talking about the six, you're talking about these six points here, right? One, two, three. Yep, each vortice is six. a magnetic pole. It's a discharging pole. This structure has undergone a significant change. The central component has attracted two smaller components resembling a photon. The distinct swipes where six bubbles or fast moving bubbles are occurring. Each of these large swipes represents a combination of elements. This structure functions as a step up transformer, transitioning from three sides to a higher electrical potential indicated by the patreons at the ends. From there, it steps back down to a lower potential. The electrical transformers installed on power lines are responsible for stepping up and down energy. This principle applies universally. But what happens when 12 bubbles meet? Here we have another stable structure emerging. However, four electrical potentials remain unaccounted for during the hunting. Despite this, the structure remains stable while attracting other components. That's the unaccounted electrical potential. And it has four of them. So this thing still is attracting, but it's a stable structure. These structures are built based on robust mathematical principles and all their electrical potential has been allocated. This phenomenon the phenomenon resembles the concept of a Bose-Einstein condensate, where an object becomes virtually indistinguishable from the fabric of the universe. This state of indistinguishability poses significant challenges. 